Hey everyone, Dr. Richard Lai here with Study Acupuncture with me. Hello, if this is your first time here, I welcome you and I thank you for stopping by. My name is Richard, I'm a doctor of physical therapy and I'm an acupuncturist. And I make content for busy acupuncturists and acupuncture students just like yourself. Now, a quick reminder about my email list. If you sign up for my email list, you get free study guides right to your email. That's every week with every theory-based episode. So how do you get on the email list? You go to www.studyaccuwithme.com and you can sign up right on the homepage. All right, now today's episode is on blood-borne pathogens. Now recently, someone reached out on Instagram about their clean needle technique exam. So for the next couple weeks, I'm going to sprinkle in topics from the CNT manual. So today we're going to talk about blood-borne pathogens. Before we get into that, let's hear a quick word from our sponsor. All right, and we're back. So today's episode is on blood-borne pathogens. First, what are blood-borne pathogens? So blood-borne pathogens are basically these infectious things that are in your blood that can cause you disease. So for example, you've probably heard of HIV, you've probably heard of malaria, syphilis, and today we're talking about hepatitis. So in acupuncture, because we're working with needles, we're putting them into people. So there's the risk for exposure to blood and body fluids. That means there's a risk for transmission of blood-borne pathogens. So it's really important for us to be cautious and hold ourselves to the highest standards of infection control and hygiene. Now, there's actually an administration known as the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, otherwise known as OSHA, and they'll actually provide guidelines and recommendations for safety. Now, that's not just in healthcare, it's in every single industry that requires safety. For example, construction jobs, warehouse jobs, and even farms, they all have safety standards. So for blood-borne pathogens, there's safety standards like clean needle technique, using sharps containers to dispose of needles, and that's because of the risk of the transmission of different things like hepatitis. So today we're going to talk about hepatitis. We're going to talk about five things with each hepatitis virus. Number one, we're going to talk about how they are transmitted. Number two, we're going to talk about their incubation period. Number three, we're going to talk about the onset of symptoms. Is it abrupt or is it insidious? Meaning, do the symptoms develop quickly and obviously or is it an insidious onset? Meaning, it comes on slowly and it's not really that obvious that you're sick. Number four, we're going to talk about is there a vaccine for each of these viruses? And then number five, we're going to talk about if each one, whether or not they develop into chronic diseases or not. So there's five different types of hepatitis that we need to know. So there's hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, hepatitis D, and hepatitis E. So A, B, C, D, E. Now hepatitis, it ends in itis. And that itis just means inflammation. So it's an inflammation of your liver. Now, a quick nugget right here is that the first ones and the last ones in the alphabetical order that I just said, A and E, those are the only ones that are transmitted through what's known as a fecal oral route, which just means that it's transmitted through contaminated food and contaminated water. So that's hepatitis A and hepatitis E. And we just said them alphabetically. A, B, C, D, E. So the first one and the last one are fecal oral roots. And actually, there was an outbreak in the United States of America of hepatitis A in 2023, just a couple months ago. And it was because of infected frozen strawberries. Now, what's cool is that they figured it out really quickly because the CDC and the FDA, they investigated it right away. And so only nine people were infected. And they were able to trace it back and figure out that it was actually from a specific brand of frozen strawberries from a specific plant sold to a specific store. So then that company in that store, they were able to recall the product before too many people got sick. So that's hepatitis A. The transmission is fecal oral. It can infect someone if they eat contaminated foods. Hepatitis E is also fecal oral. The ones in the middle, the ones that we didn't talk about yet, B, C, and D. These are the ones that are transmitted through the blood. These are the ones that are blood-borne. So again, there's five types of hepatitis, and in alphabetical order, you just go from hepatitis A, B, C, D, and E, 
And then the first and the last one, A and E, you get through fecal oral routes, which is through contaminated food and water. B, C, and D, you're going to get through the blood, like if you share needles, you have unprotected sex, or your wound touches somebody else's wound. So let's start with hepatitis A and the five things we need to know about hepatitis A. Number one, it's transmission. So it's transmitted through that fecal oral route, meaning if you eat or drink unsanitary food and water, and that food and water contains that virus, and you ingest it, and there you go, you get infected. Now that can actually happen a lot in the countries that are overcrowded, or there's just poor sanitation there. This can actually even happen in daycares, because in daycares, there's a lot of close contact, the kids are really close together, they may not wash their hands really well, and they're sharing things, and they're putting things in their mouth. And it can also happen in adults who have unprotected sexual contact with each other. So really important, good hand hygiene and clean environments around food and water are really important ways that you can reduce that risk for transmission. Now, number two, what is the incubation period for hepatitis A? First, though, what is incubation period? Incubation period just means the time frame when you get infected, like you ingest that food, to when full-blown symptoms appear in your body. And the incubation period for hepatitis A is 15 to 50 days. So with hep A, let's say you drink water, it's contaminated water, it's contaminated with hep A, and the incubation period is 15 to 50 days. And actually, according to the CNT manual, it averages around 28 days. So that means you're going to get full-blown symptoms. They're going to start to show up around the 28-day mark. That's what an incubation period is. Now, there's something else too, which is number three. Number three is, what is the onset of this disease? Is it an abrupt onset or is it an insidious onset? Now, with hep A, it's actually abrupt, meaning symptoms are going to come on quickly. Like you're going to have nausea, you're going to have vomiting, you're going to have abdominal pains because it's a fecal oral route. You drank the water, you ate the food, your stomach's not going to agree with you. The symptoms are going to come up pretty abruptly. And on the list of hepatitis A through E, there's only two on the list that are abrupt. And those two are A and E. So the symptoms for those two, they come on quickly and they come on obviously. And I think it's because of that route of transmission. Because you ate it, so then you're going to have that abdominal pain. So again, A and E are the only ones that are abrupt onset. A and E are also the only ones that are fecal oral transmission. All right, next, number four is is there a vaccine? So for hepatitis A, there is a vaccine for hepatitis A. And it's recommended for people as early as 12 months of age. And especially if you live in an overcrowded or an unsanitary conditions, like the ones that we were talking about before. Now for us as healthcare workers, we typically work in a pretty clean environment. And our biggest ally to protect against this transmission of hepatitis A is just having good hand hygiene. We wash our hands with friction, we sing our ABCs twice, and that's more than enough to help prevent hep A transmission. But besides that, there's that chance that what you're eating, like frozen strawberries, could come from an area where that food was contaminated, just like the strawberries that were sold in America this past year. And then number five, the fifth thing that we need to know is, is there evidence for chronic infection? So with hepatitis A, the answer is no. Patients who get hepatitis A don't really develop any chronic liver issues. And that's a good thing, because then they don't need to get a liver transplant later on in life. And then one more thing to know about hepatitis A is that it can actually survive in the environment for months. So it can be in that water, living there for months. So there's two ways to kill the virus. Number one, you can kill it through intense heat, meaning 185 degrees for a minute. Or the second way to kill it is through chlorination of the water. Okay, so just to recap, number one, it's transmitted through fecal oral route. Number two, the incubation period is from 15 to 50 days, averaging around 28 days. Number three, the onset. The onset for hep A is abrupt. Number four, there is a vaccine for hep A. And then number five, there's no evidence for chronic issues with hepatitis A. All right, so now we're going to talk about hepatitis B and we're going to talk about those same five topics. So the first one is, how is it transmitted? So hepatitis B is transmitted through a blood-borne pathway. So it's transmitted through contaminated blood or contaminated body fluids. So 
definitely that's something that's a risk for us in our acupuncture clinics because we're using needles. Some of us, I don't, but some of us do wet cupping. So with that, there's the risk for transmission because when we needle a patient that has hep B, let's say we accidentally prick ourselves or let's say we don't dispose the needle properly. Maybe it fell into the crack on our table and then another patient lays down on it. So there's that risk for transmission because there's that contaminated blood on the needle. Number two, what's the incubation period for hepatitis B? Now, this is a really long incubation period. The incubation period for hepatitis B is 45 to 160 days, which is insane because that means during this incubation period, you're infectious. You can spread it to other people and not see symptoms until 45 or 160 days. That, for our profession, is really risky because people have little cuts here and there, and if we're working with patients and maybe we have a paper cut on our hand and our blood or our bodily fluid touches their cut, potentially they could be infected or vice versa. And that's why hand hygiene is really important, like using protective equipment like gloves and abiding by the clean needle technique. So those are all really important ways to help us decrease that risk for hepatitis B infection. Now, number three, what is the onset of symptoms like for hepatitis B? And the answer is insidious, meaning it's not very obvious. Like with hep A, very obvious. We eat, we drink bad food, and all of a sudden we get an upset stomach, we get diarrhea. But with hep B, you get a finger prick, and you may not even know you were infected, meaning you will be asymptomatic and you could be spreading it to others without even knowing it. Number four, is there a vaccine for hepatitis B? And the answer is yes, there is a vaccine for hepatitis B. And the CDC and OSHA actually highly recommend it for anyone who works in environments like ours because there's a high risk for exposure to blood and body fluids. The same goes for people who work in dialysis centers or people who are nurses because they work with injections and they work with patients. And then number five, with hepatitis B, is there evidence for chronic issues? And the answer to that is that it depends on the age group. According to the CNT manual, 6 to 10% of adults develop chronic hepatitis. And actually children, 25 to 50% of children develop chronic issues with hepatitis B. 25 to 50%, that's extremely high. And how children get it, it, it can be through injections. Maybe the doctor's office that they went to has poor infection control processes, or it can actually go from the mother to the baby while they're pregnant or through delivery because it's blood-borne or body fluid-borne. So abiding by good hand hygiene, using our clean needle technique, using our personal protective equipment, like using gloves, gloves can actually act as an extra barrier for us in addition to our skin. So that maybe if we do get pricked, it just pricks the glove and not into our skin. All that helpful to help decrease that risk for hep B transmission. So to summarize hep B, number one, it's transmitted through the blood and body fluids. Number two, the incubation period is 45 to 160 days. Now, again, that's insane. Number three, the onset is insidious. Number four, there is a vaccine for hep B. And then number five, in terms of chronic issues, it's only 6 to 10% in adults. It's 25 to 50% in children. All right, next we have hepatitis C. Now, this is a really common one in the United States. So let's go through the five things we need to know. So the first one, number one, is that it's transmitted through the blood. Now, very commonly, it's transmitted when people share needles or through sexual contact. Now, the interesting thing about hepatitis C is that they did a study with acupuncture needles that it's actually less efficient for this virus to infect another person through the acupuncture needle. And it's more likely, it's more efficient to happen through an injectable needle, meaning a hollow needle. Because with that, you're actually directly passing blood into another person's bloodstream. But regardless, as acupuncturists, we should still exercise caution for ourselves, for our patients. Because even though there's less of a risk, there's still a risk for transmission. Now, number two, we need to know the incubation period. So the incubation period for hepatitis C is 14 to 180 days, which is similar to hepatitis B. Hepatitis B was 160 days. So hep C is only 20 days more. Number three, 
Hepatitis C, the onset is also insidious. Now, again, the only two that are abrupt are the top ones and the bottom ones, hepatitis A and hepatitis E. The rest, the ones in the middle, B, C, and D, they're all insidious onsets, meaning the onset of symptoms, they're not obvious. And then number four, is there a vaccine for hepatitis C? Now, here's the scary thing. There is no vaccine for hepatitis C. So that's all the more reason to exercise caution. And then lastly, number five, with hepatitis C, it's crazy, but 75 to 85% of people will develop chronic infection. And 60 to 70% of those people that are infected will develop chronic hepatitis, meaning their liver is going to be chronically inflamed. And that can actually lead to them needing a liver transplant later on in life. So for your CNT exam, you're going to need to know that number, 75 to 85%. So to recap hepatitis C, number one, it's very common in the U.S. and it's transmitted through the blood and it's very efficiently transmitted through sharing injectable needles. Number two, the incubation period is 14 to 180 days, which is 20 days more than hepatitis B. Number three, hepatitis C has an insidious onset, just like hepatitis B and hepatitis D. Number four, is there a vaccine for hepatitis C? And no, unfortunately, there is not a vaccine for hepatitis C. And then number five, does it develop into chronic issues? And actually, 60 to 70% of people develop chronic issues, and they even end up needing a liver transplant. All right, next, we have hepatitis D, and then we have hepatitis E. So hepatitis D is an interesting one because they call it a defective virus. You can only get hepatitis D if you already have hepatitis B, which means that it can only replicate itself in your body if you already have hepatitis B. So number one, how is hepatitis D transmitted? So it's transmitted through percutaneous or mucosal contact with infected blood. And that just means that it's spread from one person to another through infected blood or infected body fluids. So if you share a razor blade with someone, like you want to shave your mustache, or you share a toothbrush with someone, or you actually get stuck with a needle which has contaminated blood on it. Now, number two, the incubation period. Now, if you look in your CNT manual, it says that the incubation period is unknown. So for your CNT exam, that's the answer. But according to the CDC, the onset of symptoms is anywhere from three to seven weeks. All right, now number three, for the onset, is hepatitis D insidious or is it onset? And the answer is that it's insidious. It's not an obvious onset, it's a slow onset, just like the onset for hepatitis B and hepatitis C. And then number four, is there a vaccine for hepatitis D? And the answer is no, there isn't. But if you're vaccinated for hepatitis B, then that actually protects you from getting hepatitis D. Because hepatitis D needs hepatitis B in order to replicate itself in your body. So if you don't have hepatitis B, then you can't get hepatitis D. And then lastly, number five, what's the risk for developing chronic issues with hepatitis D? And the answer is actually unknown according to your CNT manual. So that would be your answer for the CNT exam. But from the CDC, it's actually a little complicated because First of all, hepatitis D, you can only get it if you already have hepatitis B. And with hepatitis D, there's something known as a super infection. So what that is, is basically someone who gets hepatitis B and it turns into a chronic infection. And then while hepatitis B is in its chronic state, then you get hepatitis D. And that's a hepatitis D super infection. And it's actually going to cause a rapid progression into liver cirrhosis and liver failure which is really severe. But anyway, according to the manual, the CNT manual, it says that chronic issues are unknown. So just to summarize hepatitis D, number one, it's transmitted through percutaneous or mucosal contact with infectious blood. Number two, the incubation period is unknown. Number three, the onset for hepatitis D is insidious. Number four, the vaccine, there is none for hepatitis D. And then number five, it's unknown whether there are chronic issues or not. All right, now lastly, we have hepatitis E. Now with hepatitis E, number one, it's transmitted through that fecal oral route, just like hepatitis A. It can be spread if someone drinks contaminated water or they eat contaminated food. 
Now, number two, the incubation period for hepatitis E is anywhere from 15 to 60 days. And the CNT manual says with an average of 40 days. Now, number three, the onset for hepatitis E is abrupt. So once that person drinks that contaminated water, pretty quickly they're going to have abdominal pain, they're going to have a fever, they're going to have nausea, they're going to know that they're sick. And then number four, is there a vaccine for hepatitis E? And actually, no, there isn't. And here's a scary percentage when I was researching this. There's actually a mortality rate in pregnant women of 20% for hepatitis E. And mortality rate, it means death rate. So 20% of pregnant women, meaning one in five pregnant women, if they're infected with hep E, they pass away. So that's a really scary number. So if you're traveling to countries that are developing and you're questioning the source of their water, make sure you buy bottled water and try not to drink table water when you're at a restaurant. And then number five, are there chronic infectious issues with hepatitis E? And the answer is no. Research shows that there's no chronic issues. All right, and that actually brings us to the end of this episode on hepatitis. So I hope that helps you. And if you're a visual learner, there's a YouTube video of this with the table so that you can follow along. And when you look at that table, notice the bolded things that I bolded because it shows sort of a pattern with the table. And if you recognize patterns with the information that you're trying to memorize and understand, it can help you remember it, especially if you're a visual learner. And of course, if you're on the email list, you're going to get a study guide with this episode. And if you're not on the email list, go and sign up now at www.studyaccuwithme.com. And then one more thing before I let you go. I just want to thank you guys for taking the time to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps the podcast, actually. And recently, Mr. C left a really nice five-star review. And he said, as a licensed acupuncturist, I love geeking out to acupuncture podcasts. When I came across this podcast, I figured a review of the basics could be a good use of some downtime. I'm incredibly impressed and I wish I had a resource like this when I was in school. I feel like I'm even learning some new things I missed the first time around. I'm very grateful for all the effort put into such a practical and helpful resource. Well, I thank you, Mr. C. And your patients are actually really lucky because you're investing your time into being a lifelong learner. All right, everyone, that's it for this episode. Until next time, God bless and happy studying.